Good afternoon, welcome, and salam alaikum. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome you all to the Aga Khan Museum. I'm looking around and seeing many familiar faces of those of you who have joined us for many of these lectures. And I'm uh, very happy to have you here today with us, joining us at the Aga Khan Museum. My name is Ruba Kanaan, and I'm the head of education and scholarly programs here at the Aga Khan Museum. I'm the organizer of this lecture series, and of course, it's always uh, a wonderful feeling when you know that you've organized something that people are coming to repeatedly, which I hope means that you're enjoying it, and that we are able to reach so many people at their homes through the recording of these lectures, as the lectures will be recorded and will be available through, uh, through a Vimeo channel and or on our website um, in a few weeks' time. So it's great to have you here. And this lecture series is, of course, about Islam and Muslim societies. As most of you know by now, uh, we've opened the museum almost two years ago. And we shared with the visitors many, many wonderful exhibitions and, of course, our art collection, which focuses on building bridges between cultures and talking about the mutual understanding and relationship amongst cultures and civilizations. With this new lecture series, we are expanding the space of engagement and conversation. In part, we're responding to your request to provide context to some of the, uh, to the museum collection and the activities that happen at the museum. And of course, respond to the many, many questions about Islam and Muslims that are raised to us at the museum. We're also fulfilling the museum's mission that was set to us by our museum founder, His Highness the Aga Khan, a mission to create better mutual knowledge and understanding amongst people and encourage enlightened conversations. The purpose is demystifying Islam and Muslims and defying the very loud voice of a violent minority that seeks a world divided. This voice is unfortunately, it occupies um, much of the airwaves these days. Before I move to the pleasure of introducing our speaker for today, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the many organizations and institutions um, that um, that were instrumental f for in the museums um, sup in supporting this lecture series and enabling us to have it. For the lecture series, first, we are very grateful for the support of Massey College at the University of Toronto. In addition to sponsoring the series, Massey College is generously providing the refreshments that you will enjoy at the close of lecture today. And this has been recurrent after each lecture as these refreshments and the conversations that happen there continue the discussions and debates that happen in the gallery. And we're very grateful for that. We also would like to acknowledge, uh, to thank our media sponsor, the Globe and Mail. I'm sure you all saw the Globe and Mail's big uh, ad for the lecture series, but also they've been working with us on many of the introductions of, the, of some of the speakers. We're also excited to acknowledge a host of community partners, like-minded organizations and institutions who share the spirit of inquiry, engagement, and debate that these new lectures bring. These are in alphabetical order, the Canadian Arab Institute, the Institute of Canadian Citizen for Canadian Citizenship, Kwanis Don Mills and Kwanis Toronto, the Monk School of Global Affairs, Noor Cultural Centre, the Paria Trillium Foundation, Ryerson University MENA Studies Centre, that's Middle East and North Africa Studies Centre, and the Tessellate Institute. It's very important for us as a museum to have the support of community partners who would make uh, their own members aware of what's happening at the museum and thus enable us to do more and more activities. So I really appreciate uh, all of that. Um, just two points of sort of um, 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 logistics first. Uh, we have created a hashtag for the museum, which is hashtag AKM lectures, so please feel free to use it. And on the screen now, you'll have the uh, Wi-Fi and the hashtag itself. And also, for those of you who have not visited the gallery, we encourage you to do so. And in fact, if you have your ticket for today, uh, you would have a 20% reduction on the gallery admission for today. 
But now for the pleasurable business at hand, introducing Professor Ali Asani, who's giving a lecture entitled Communing with the Divine, Islamic Mystical Traditions and the Arts. Ali Asani is professor of Indo-Muslim and Islamic religion and cultures at Harvard University. He's also director of Harvard University's Prince Al-Walid bin Talal program in Islamic studies. He's always been at Harvard, as he would say. He was there at, uh, um, as an undergraduate concentrating on comparative study of religion. Then he did his doctoral studies in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. And of course, since then has been teaching and researching and doing wonderful work there. As a scholar of Islam in South Asia, he teaches courses on various aspects of Islamic traditions, including Sufi and Ismaili history, thought, and literature. He is particularly interested in the interaction between religion, literature, and the arts in Muslim societies. And this is where uh, Professor Asani and some of his colleagues at Harvard are pioneers in using the arts in a ped pedagogical manner to teach um, the broader effects of what, he, what they call at Harvard religious literacy, the notion that, uh, that, uh, that the rich subtext and diverse influences that make religion, and in particular, of course, with his focus Islam, a complex cultural touchstone. He is recipient of many awards and he has many, many books, but I'm sure what you need now is to hear him rather than the long introduction that would take me to, take, to mention all his publications. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ali Asani. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would first like to thank the Aga Khan Museum um, for inviting me to be part of this um, lecture series. Um, and um, uh, it's an ambitious, the material that I'm going to try to cover uh, is ambitious for a 50 minute um, presentation. So I'm just going to go straight ahead into the presentation itself. So, I'm going to start out with, because I'm talking about mysticism, and I think it's very important to clarify what one thinks, what, what is mysticism. Uh, Evelyn Underhill, who has written one of the classic works on mysticism across religious traditions, says that mysticism is one of the most abused words in the English language. It has been used, she said, in different and often mutually exclusive senses by religion, poetry, and philosophy, has been claimed as an excuse for every kind of occultism, for dilute transcendentalism, vapid symbolism, religious or aesthetic sentimentality, and bad metaphysics. On the other hand, it has been freely employed as a term of contempt by those who have criticized these things. In modern usage, I would add, mysticism, like its linguistic cousin myth, is often used pejoratively to dismiss sloppy or superstitious thinking. The New World Dictionary, in fact, defines the word mysticism as quote unquote vague, obscure, and confused thinking or belief. <laughs> Our hero in here, Evelyn Underhill, uh, who's trying to bring some more sense into how we think about this, she said, she writes in her book, uh, sorry, yeah, she writes in her book, it is not an opinion, it's not a philosophy, it is nothing in common with the pursuit of occult knowledge. It is the name of that organic process which involves the perfect consummation of the love of God, the achievement here and now of the immortal heritage of man. Or, she says, if you like it better, for this means exactly the same thing, it is the art of establishing a conscious relationship with the absolute. So with this, she explores different mysticism in different uh, world religions. My own teacher, um, uh, 
who exposed me, really, who introduced me to the idea of Islamic mysticism or mysticism within the, uh, within the context of the Islamic traditions, uh, the late Anne-Marie Schimmel. Uh, she's written many, many books on this, on this subject. And one of her most famous books uh, on this subject, it's a classic, uh, The Mystical Dimensions of, of Islam. Uh, in this book, she starts out the book by saying, what is Islamic mysticism, which is generally identified as Sufism. So there's this notion that Sufism equals Islamic mysticism. And she starts the introductory chapter by quoting a story uh, uh, attributed to Jalaluddin Rumi, one of the great mystics of the Islamic tradition, who talks about who, who talks about these blind men who are, try, who are trying to describe an elephant. What is an elephant? And as you can see from this uh, nice little cartoon, everyone had a totally different definition of what it is. And she makes the point that really when we talk about Islamic mysticism or mysticism in a, in a, uh, within the context of Islamic traditions, we are, we are bound to find contradictory definitions. Um, and part of what she points out is that, in fact, this term Sufism or Islamic mysticism is just a label of convenience that people use. And then under this label, they will, we, uh, they will, put, they will group all kinds of different phenomena that they see connected with Muslims. Um, and also including phenomena that are, belong to different Muslim communities that today see themselves as having very distinctive identities like Shia and Ismaili and so on. But in fact, what she points out is that this phenomena that we are talking about actually transcends all these labels that, we, that, that are created because she sees certain similarities. Um, so for instance, uh, as an example of what she would uh, what she would call is something that goes across traditions. She takes, for example, the figure of uh, Hazrat Ali uh, ibn Abi Talib, the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad, who for the Shia, uh, based on their notions of authority, say that after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, Ali uh, um, uh, had, you know, and his descendants have the right of authority over religious spiritual and political affairs uh, in among the Muslim communities. This is, of course, a different position than Sunnis. So there's this figure of Ali. But you do find that, however, the figure of Ali is greatly respected by Sunnis as well. It isn't either or. But more importantly, in these Islamic mystical traditions, the figure of Ali is revered um, because he is seen as the primary transmitter of esoteric traditions and truths that go back to the Prophet Muhammad. And then there's a, a lineage of transmitters stemming from him that are responsible for this. So here you see this figure of Ali and you see the ambiguities about what we are talking about here. Um, and I think one of the ways I personally think it's better to think about this Islamic mysticism or Sufism, even though the terms Sufism and Islamic mysticism imply an ideology, I think they're basically Western constructs that try to label things. What we are dealing with here, rather than an ideology, it's a way of being, a way of looking at the world, a disposition, I would say. And when you think about it that way, it, is, it becomes much easier to say that these are ways of disposition and some ways of being, and some Muslims are inclined towards this disposition, and some Muslims are not. And this gets beyond all the sectarian uh, boundaries. What is very interesting in the development of these traditions, uh, Islamic mysticism, and I think you see it in, uh, you see it in some of the work that's here at the museum, is the centrality of the sonic, by sonic I mean the sound arts, uh, visual and literary arts uh, that are central as a means of expression. So how do you, what do you, how, 
how do you learn about this way of being, this way of existing, this disposition? Very often the chief tools are the arts, broadly defined. And then the arts become also a very important form of practice, as we will see. And one may say, why the arts? Why have the arts become the central tool of expression? Uh, I think, personally, it goes back to the Quran itself. For those of you who are familiar with the history of Islam, know that the Quran, even though today we think about it as a book, as a scripture, that is codified and between two covers, the word Quran actually means recitation. And in fact, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, who received these revelations that come to be part of the, uh, codified as the Quran, there was no book. People experienced the text through the year. He would get revelations, he would recite them, uh, and as he would recite them, people would be moved by these recitations. It became a transcending experience, a transcendental, because what was involved was the aesthetics, the beauty of the text itself as it's recited. Uh, and in fact, he was often accused of being a poet. And he refuted uh, this, uh, this accusation by saying, I'm not a poet, I'm a prophet. The reason why he was accused of being a poet was because the preeminent form, the preeminent art form in Arab society at the time was poetry. And poets were very powerful people in, culture, in society at the time. And poets were seen as, in fact, these intermediary figures between this world and the next. And they were seen as influenced by jinns. The Prophet Muhammad said, I'm not a poet, I'm not influenced by jinns. What I am revealing to you comes from the one God, the one God of the Christians and the Jews, the word Allah that he uses. And this is a verbal message. Uh, and the aesthetics of the text, the beauty of the text, which cannot be captured in English translation, which is why most Muslims experience the Quran through the year. And a beautiful Quran recitation can really move people to tears. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the time. If we had some time, I would have gladly played you some Quran recitations to show you what I mean. But the art of Quran recitation becomes absolutely central. And even though today we have the Quran as a book, uh, in the form of book, the oral dimension of the Quran continues to be important in Muslim societies today and you'll see the Quran experience through the year. Uh, and this is something that I would encourage you to explore. But what this means is that sound, listening to sacred sound, because if this is believed to be God's word that becomes manifest uh, in, the, uh, in the material world, listening to sound, sound becomes a carrier, a force through which you can access the spiritual, the transcendent, and you connect with the transcendent, all kinds of sounds. And this is why you find that the Quran is really at the heart of a soundscape, an Islamic soundscape that permeates traditions of spirituality, the arts of poetry, music, we'll talk about some of these in a few minutes, uh, and also dance. Um, as vehicles to transcend the material. There's the aesthetics of these, these art forms as something to transcend, take you away from the material and point you into another dimension of um, existence. Now, even though having given you this background about the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran and so on, it is interesting uh, and if you go back to that image of that elephant that was being described in different ways, there's a great deal of controversy today about whether Sufism is something Islamic. There are people, Muslims and non-Muslims, who consider Sufism or this kind of disposition that is to be, has nothing to do with Islam or their definition of what Islam is. They see it as a foreign influence that has been borrowed. I want to Talk, uh, so amongst the non-Muslims, for example, there have been tendencies to associate 
Islam with things like violence, terror, and so on. When they look at Islamic mystical traditions and some of the poetry, as you will see, it's filled with love. Love for God, love for humanity. And that, unfortunately, does not fit their image of Islam. So therefore, they say, this is not Islamic. It's borrowed from Christianity. And there are theoreticians who talk about Sufism as an import from the Christian tradition. Uh, uh, they, there are people who also talked about Sufism as a halfway house between Christianity and Judaism, but that's been incorporated into Islam. So everything that's good that they see in the Islamic tradition is a borrowing. But there are Muslims themselves who also debate about whether this is legitimate. And this has become a very interesting issue, a central issue in 18th and 19th century Islam. Um, with the rise of various kinds of reformist and revival groups that are trying to purify the practice of Islam. Uh, and again, that's a long history. But some of these reform movements attack what they see are Sufi practices uh, as being un-Islamic. And it's not only individuals, but also nation states. Because as we will see, uh, many of these move, many of the people who are involved with this kind of Sufi movement have tremendous power amongst the masses. Because the kind of, this way of being, this way of thinking has tremendous popularity at the mass level. And because of that, they're seen as threats to politicians, the nation states, ideologies that claim that they're very exclusive and hegemonic, and therefore they come under attack. Uh, and I'll give you um, an example of that shortly. On the other hand, you have many Muslims who say that, in fact, the only way to understand Islam is through this worldview, and that this worldview is what is Islam what Islam is all about. And a wonderful example of that is uh, Jalal al-Din Rumi, this great mystic who wrote this work in Persian, the Masnavi, an epic, uh, which has been called the Quran in Persian. Why is it called the Quran in Persian? Because for Persian speakers, they see this text uh, embodying the inner, inner, inner meanings of the Quran in the vernacular. And therefore, they revere this text as actually a kind of a scripture that, that helps them think about. So the Quran, they say, has an external meaning and an internal meaning, and the internal meaning has an internal meaning, and the internal meaning has an internal meaning, and so on seven times. And to get to the heart of the meaning of the Quran, beyond what the literal is, you need some sort of a commentary. And they would say, this is where you get the commentary in the poetry. Um, I talked about, you also get this commentary in art forms like the Kawali, which we'll be talking about. Um, I put here uh, uh, the image of Amjad Sabri, a very famous Kawali singer who most tragically got shot a couple of, weeks, a couple of days ago by the Taliban in Karachi because this was not their interpretation of Islam. So you can see how the arts him being an artist and his worldview is under attack. Um, what I see really is happening here uh, is following an analogy that Muhammad Arkun, the, the famous uh, uh, philosopher who taught at the Sorbonne, in one of his works he talks about loud Islam. And by loud Islam, he means the Islam that's very, that's egotistical, that's all about hegemony and power, that constructions of Islam that are hegemonic, imperialistic, and so on, and which obviously get, they're loud in the sense they get the attention of the media and so on. He says that's that loud Islam. And then we have this other Islam, the Islam of faith, which is silent because people who are practicing Islam you know, as a matter of fact, don't want to be egotistical about what they're practicing, what their beliefs are, and they're silent about it. But they've also, in certain cases, been silenced, as we saw in the case of um, this famous uh, Quran singer. So this tension between this loud Islam and silent Islam, and of course, today, when we think, how do you know what you know about Islam? 
the media focuses on the loud Islam, you hardly get anything about any perceptions about the silent Islam. And in a certain way, this museum and its collection in one way is silent because it does, it's here in a museum. Uh, it doesn't broadcast, but you have to appreciate it, you know, in a certain, anyway. So this is something that I thought would be useful for us to think about. Now, what kinds of factors have led to this esoteric outlook, this disposition uh, towards the mystical or the spiritual? I think, first of all, there is a historical uh, political context to this. We find that already in the uh, 7th and 8th century, there were certain Muslims who were quite dismayed by the way Islam was being interpreted or the vision of the Prophet Muhammad was interpreted along political grounds. They felt that Islam had, was being used as an ideology of empire building power. People had been consumed by materialism and wealth and so on. And they felt it was a total betrayal of the vision of the Prophet Muhammad who, was very, who was, uh, had a very simple lifestyle, who was an ascetic, uh, in a certain way, didn't believe in all these luxuries. He would give away the very food that he had if anyone was poor. He didn't live in a big palace or anything like that. And he also was given to meditation. And they said these, these developments were very disturbing for them. So part of this was a reaction against what they felt was a betrayal of the tradition. Another response that I think becomes important is uh, that's connected to the first, is that in the 8th and 9th century, you see forms, the development of interpretations of Islam that are looking at Islam as law or Islam as rituals. And they are, design, they are defining the relationship between human and divine just on the basis of the law. So how do you relate to the divine? You have to follow the laws. Or how do you relate to the light? You have to perform all these rituals. But they reduced this very rich human divine relationships to these mundane things like law and rituals. And these groups said, no, there is much more to the human divine relationship than this. So this is another factor uh, that, um, uh, that led to the development of this emphasis on the esoteric. Um, if we get time, I will come back to the external influences during question time. But a very, very important source of this, uh, 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 of this disposition, this way of being, actually stems from the Quran itself. I mentioned the revelation of the Quran that was an oral text, but also you have lots and lots of verses in the Quran that talk about an inner dimension of existence. Um, and here, for example, we talk about God is not just transcendent, but God is closer to a human being than than the vein in your uh, neck, the jugular vein. Or, and there is this great development, what you see in the Quran, this distinction between the realm, um, the, the external realm, the realm of the physical, and the realm of the inner, the hidden, the spiritual, this dichotomy between the zahir and the batin. And when you're talking about the mystical, what is real, they would say, this is what you're talking about. So that the Quran has this aware, has, talks about this, the inner. So for instance, there is this verse in the Quran that says, wherever you turn, you will see the face of God. What does it mean to see the face of God? When you physically look around you, are you seeing the face of God? When you see nature, are you seeing the face of God? Why? Because physically you may not be seeing the face of God at the level of the Zahir, but if you had spiritual insight, if you were able to see with the heart rather than the eye, you would see the face of God. It's a question of reading, how you read the external world. Can you see the spiritual that is hidden behind the physical? And it's a very, very strong notion that you find in the Quran, and you see also this verse in the Quran where Moses, uh, in a Quranic verse, tells God that I want to see you. And God says that no, you cannot see me, maybe because Moses went seeing with the physical eye, and says you should look at the mountain, and you'll see what happens to the mountain, 
And of course, uh, you know, God reveals himself to the mountain. The mountain uh, collab uh, collapses and Moses falls into a swoon. He becomes unconscious. So this idea that divine realities, the batin, is not easily accessible if you think about it just in physical terms. But if you are able to read things spiritually, then it's accessible to you. So if you see with the eye, you cannot see these things with the eye because it's not rational, it's not sensory, but you can feel it with the heart. And this idea of seeing the divine becomes a characteristic way in which people define who uh, this category mystic, which I said it's a very ambiguous category, but you see uh, in the Quran examples, for example, of Solomon, the prophet Suleiman, who could, who could understand the language of the birds and the language of the animals because he could see beyond the physical. Beyond the physical, we just listen to this and you think, oh, that's a pretty song or that's a pretty call. But he could understand what they were actually saying, which is he could go beyond the physical and go into the, into the spiritual. So he becomes an example of the, in the Quran of the mystic, but also who is the wise king. And of course, the ultimate uh, example that you find in the Quran of this coming into contact with the inner world is, of course, the story of Prophet Muhammad and the Miraj, his ascension to heaven. So the story goes that one day the Prophet Muhammad was asleep, and a, the angel Gabriel, this is how it, the traditional story, the angel Gabriel woke him up and said, you're going on a journey. And then he went from, that journey is called Isra. He went from Mecca, and he was taken to Jerusalem. And then at Jerusalem, he met all the other prophets. They prayed together at the Dome of the Rock. And then he ascended the heavens on this mysterious creature called the Burak. And there are references in the Quran to this particular experience. And of course, this experience has been illustrated in art and also in poetry and so on. And here's an artistic rendering of this experience. And when uh, and all of these things, so here you see the Burak, the mystical horse, the mythical horse creature, and the angel Gabriel. What is interesting is he goes through all the heavens and then ultimately comes to his face-to-face -face meeting with God. And at that point, the story, one of the, one of the versions of the story says that the angel Gabriel tells him that I cannot come in there with you. You have to go there on your own. And there's been a whole lot of speculation. Well, what does this story mean? Did he make this journey physically? Is this a metaphor? Is this an allegory? What is this? And one of the interpretations of why the angel Gabriel could not go in there in his meeting with God, because the angel Gabriel is symbolic of rational knowledge, of akal, the intellect. And to experience God, to know God, you can the intellect fails because God, God is beyond rational thought and analysis. And Burak, in this context, is sometimes seen as a symbol of love. That love can transport you to the very presence of God because if, if you're in love with God, you can experience God. But you cannot experience God through rationality alone. Rationality can let you know about God, but you can't know God through rationality alone. Now, this is a very interesting image from Central Asia. The first one was from Iran. The second, this one is from Central Asia, from a very interesting manuscript where they actually do illustrate the prophet's face. Um, and here you see the prophet in the presence of God. And you see it's very interesting. God is not depicted. There are these flames, which are because God is symbolized as light. And you can see the posture of the prophet in total submission, in prostration. And this gave rise to a lot of speculation, is that in the presence of God, there can only be one ego. There's a story, for example, of Rumi, who says, who takes and this is a very common thing you'll find in Sufi. They take the shahada, the Muslim profession of faith, 
la ilaha, there is no God, which means when you recite that you're, you're negating the personal ego, illallah, affirming that there is only one ego. Uh, to explain this, some, you know, there are also traditions that talk about the inner jihad, the jihad against your ego, because it's your ego that keeps you from the experiencing the, the spiritual. Um, and so um, Rumi also has a very interesting story where he's, he talks about how there's the two people, one's inside the room and one's outside the room, and the person inside the room, uh, or the person outside the room knocks on the door, and the person inside says, who is it? And the person outside says, it's me. The person inside, you can't come in. And this happens, several, go away. This happens several times until the person outside knocks at the door, who is it? And the person outside says, it's you. You may come in because you've been transformed. So some of the central questions that emerge in this are who are we and where do we come from and what are we doing here and where are we going? And the message that you find that comes out from this tradition, this way of looking at the world, is really talking about we are all sold in exile. So this turns back to a primordial event that is mentioned in the Quran where God called out to the uncreated creation with this word, alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And the uncreated creation comes into being by saying, bala shahidna, yes, we witness it. So the act of creation itself is seen according to this in response to God's call. Now this particular event is seen uh, in these circles as actually the beginning of a covenant of love between God and all of creation. Um, he loves them and they love him. And in the poetic imagination, this event where all the lovers are with the divine beloved is seen really as a fantastic party where everyone's happy and joyous and ecstatic. And you have the renditions of this in poetic forms. This is a very famous, famous Persian poet, uh, Amir Khusro, who's describing his experience, uh, an experience that he, in his poetry, of this experience that he had, that he was at a mysterious place last night. Last night, he means the primordial times. Uh, and I'll have uh, Jackson, if you can play this piece just for a little. Uh. I don't know. This is where we are. All right, okay. 
thank you. All right. So this is a fascinating piece, but this idea, what is this rux abyssal? Those who have given up their ego, the victims out of love for God, and they're all dancing in ecstasy because they're united with their beloved. And if you look at the further down this line, you see very interesting, God himself was presiding over this assembly, that God was present there. And look at, and the prophet Muhammad was in the light, was the light of the ceremonies. He was there too, reciting poetry in this ecstatic state. So this event um, is a kind of what I would say a theology of love, but that's subversive. And I'll talk about why it's subversive. Um, but it dominates really a way of thinking. So for instance, here is a 12th century commentary, a, su a commentary on the Quran, looking at the Quran um, by the scholar Maybudi, who says that actually the Quran, the title of the Quran, it's a book of love. It is a book, it's a Lord's reminder to his lovers, the eternal love, a book whose purport is to tell the story of love and lovers. And this idea that you can think about the Quran as a book of love and, and really embodying the human divine relationship in love is definitely a different way to think about the Quran. But, and this is also echoed by another sort of uh, interpretation of the Quran um, as the book of passion, Ishknama. And he says, if people do not understand that the Quran is a book about love, it is because they read the book with the eyes of jurisprudence or theology or philosophy but they don't read the book through the eye of love. So this primordial event is seen as actually affecting very deeply the human divine relationship and how we should be looking at scriptures. And this idea, when you start talking about love, is that it's a love that transforms. And they talk about the human love, metaphorical, just as human love can be a transformative experience, the divine love, the ishke hakiki, can also be transformative. And it transforms you from being egocentric to God-centric. Um, and hence, you find all these very interesting, well, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, but this thing from the Quran. Our life takes its color from God, and who could give it a better color than God? And this idea of God is somebody who dyes people with his color. And people are being dyed with the color of God because they're being transformed through love. And this becomes, of course, very, very central. We were talking about the Zahir and the Batin. So here's the Zahir and here's the Batin. And the idea is that if we're at the Zahir and we need to understand the real, what is real as opposed to the Batin, which the Zahir, which is transitory, uh, we need to undertake a journey, and the journey is the tariqa, the path, as we'll see, under the guidance of a, uh, uh, a teacher, who then takes you into the hakika. And you go, this journey involves various uh, process of transformation, the self-transformation. You have, you have to have a guide who takes you to this. Uh, and the ultimate goal is, of course, going from being uh, egocentric to God-centric. And this, of course, journey is represented in many, many works of uh, uh, Islamic mysticism. One of the uh, marvels is the Conference of the Birds. It tells the story of these birds that set out a journey looking for the king of birds, the sea morgue. And, um, and ultimately, the birds, as they go through this journey, uh, many of them just fall out along the way. It's a kind of a pilgrim's progress. And at the end, only 30 birds survive, sea morgue. And when they enter the, the palace of what's supposed to be the king of the birds, God, they see a mirror. And in the mirror, they see themselves, sea morgue. So it's a pun. It's a pun. Sea morgues mean 30 birds, but they realize that this God that they're looking for, this king that they're looking for, is within themselves. It's not external. 
and you find all kinds of uh, uh, exclamations of this. Uh, Al Halaj, a mystic who was some, you know, martyred for some of his beliefs, but this idea of this identification with this total transformation and identification with the uh, uh, um, with, with, in this divine stage, right? So this idea that self-knowledge, knowing who you are, actually gives you knowledge of God. So here you have a very interesting representation of this. It talks about love play, but actually it means the game of love with God. The material world is full of anguish, and what does she really want? Give me that wine, the wine of love, the wine of divine love, which you gave to Shibli and Mansur. Mansur is a reference to Halaj. And Baydam, the poet that she is actually, uh, the poet who she's singing, says, give me, let me to the tavern of wine. So here, ironically, you get this flip, what the subversive image is, what's supposed to be forbidden in Sharia. Because it is intoxicating, it resembles love, the selfless love, Therefore, it, it, becomes the, um, uh, it becomes the model of what you want. Um, and there's, of course, this conflict that emerges between understanding faith through the rational, uh, 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 through the rational faculties, ilm, and also understanding faith through experience, through spiritual experience, through gnosis, uh, marifa. And this, of course, leads to a lot of conflict. Now, some of the, one of the central concerns about reciting all this poetry and music is to awaken um, remembrance. The idea that through creation, all creation has forgotten that its true home lies with God, that primordial moment. We've been covered over by material existence and that material existence and the ego have made us forget who we really are. So we are in the sleep of negligence. We need to be awakened from the sleep of negligence. And the arts and music and poetry have a way of reminding us because they have an emotive element uh, to them. And so you get different types of uh, uh, rituals and practices, sometimes just zikr, remembrance of the names of God, uh, sama, listening, uh, kawali, and then, um, which is a form of sama, listening that's characteristic of the Islamic tradition in South Asia. I'm going to now play you uh, sama uh, in the form of a dance. And uh, this, of course, some of you will know from the uh, ritual of the whirling dervishes in Turkey. Okay, so. In the 13th century, while most Turkish Muslims worshipped in iconic mosques, an entirely new display of praise began to gather a following. Known as the Sema ritual, it was the vision of Sufi master Rumi. The purpose to honor Allah and chronicle the spiritual path man must take on the journey to enlightenment. Semisens from the Mevlevi order of whirling dervishes are the only ones allowed to perform the ceremony. It's captivating for us, but meant for the heavens. A powerful display performed in a trance-like state. While we whirl, we say uh, Allah. It's the name of the God. We don't think anything about our family, our work, other people, just Allah. With unwavering focus, the Sema Sen complete as many as 2,000 turns during the Sema ritual. Every spin, every body position is a deliberate, intentional gesture meant to honor God and embrace his benevolence. Right hand looks to the sky, mm -hmm. and the other looks to uh, air. Mm -hmm. It's to symbolize uh, that comes from the God, and we should share with people. The Sufi Mevlevi order was outlawed in 1925 and is still technically illegal. But the right to perform the Sema ritual was reinstated in 1954. 
Turkey's whirling dervishes ritual is such a rare treasure that it is one. So, here you see another form of ritual to connect, to, to bridge the abyss between human and divine, but here through music, because in the words of Rumi, he says, music and the sounds that we hear in music actually remind us of primordial memories. That event of a lust is very often imagined as a concert, a musical concert, where everyone was dancing. You see that in that Persian verse, everyone was in this dance of ecstasy. So according to Rumi, music, when we hear music, there can be good music and there can be bad music, but the good music, you can sort of say organic music, uh, incites within the soul primordial memories. You may not be conscious about it, but that's what happens. And this is why this, this music, when we hear this music, it reminds us some of those primordial sounds. Um, and you see some very interesting illustrations about this idea of this dance. Here you see people are um, uh, involved in a, in a dance session here. But what is interesting with this particular artist, if you look closely here, you see the angels in the heavens, they're also dancing because they're in the presence of God. So this idea of dance and music uh, permeates this. And then we have also the poetic renditions of this. This is a very famous Masnavi, which I've been talking about, uh, which is talking about the reed flute. Um, listen to the reed flute as it tells a tale, as it complains of separations. Uh, Ever since I was cut off from the reed bed, men and women have lamented my bevailing. And it's very interesting because the reed flute symbolizes the soul on the one hand, but then the soul that is separated from God is playing a music, and the music is affecting other people because of its deep, uh, uh, because it's painful memories that it is evoking. So I will end by showing a short clip uh, by Farid Mawash, a very famous Afghan singer, who is uh, who's, who's singing this um, this particular piece uh, at the Festival of Sacred Music in Fez. And the reason I picked this is because in this clip she actually talks about why she's singing this and what it means for her. طریقت و طریقت چشتی است اشعار تصوف هم میخوانم همیشه و از طریق خزمی من عبادت میکنم به خدای خود از طریق شعر مولانا شعر بیده اشعار تصوف همیشه فکر میکنم که من در حالت عبادت هستم به خدای خود Oh, yeah. 
میخوانم به درون آهنگ میدرایم اما تو سن افغانا هر تیدادی که هستن اتر فکر میکنم که دل از اون ما ام دل ام دل از اونا شدیم کل دل ما یک دل شده فقط از طرف از اونا از طرف خود میگم بشنو از نیتون حکایت میکند از جدایی ها شکایت میکنه به خاطر که وطن تو تا تو تشره همه ما جدا هستیم ارزو نای حدیث برای پرخون میکنند قصه های عشق مجنون تا اسلام موسیقی را بعد نمیگن ملاها میگن بد است اسلام هیچ وقت موسیقی را منع نکده هیچ وقت بد نیست در اسلام ای که ملاها چی میگن و چرا نمیخواین که موسیقی باشه و پیشتر برتان گفتم که 80 فیصد ما بیچارگی ما در بیسوادی ما است که ما مطالعه نداریم من خود تا که زنده هستم همیشه خدمتگاری نمی مردم هستم از طریق موسیقی And this is where the conflict generally resides. All right, so here you see a very interesting manifestation, a contemporary manifestation of this mystical poetry in performance. Uh, it's part, of course, of the world music series, but the way some of the things that she says, I want to point out. One, that when she's singing it, the, the art of singing and the emotion that she gets, there's a kind of a spiritual bond that exists between the performer and the audience. And even if the audience understand all the philosophy and all the mystical talk, they connect with it. And that's the beauty of the arts. They have the way you're talking about, as opposed to political ideologies or religious ideologies, they talk about differentiation and ideologies of difference. The arts have a way to communicate human to human. And that's why she's talking about the soul, how she feels that we are all one. She becomes one with her audience. And many Muslim performers, whether you're talking about Abida Parveen or uh, Farideh Mawash or other, uh, from, will often tell you that this is what the performance does to them, that it's a transformative experience. But you also saw how she connected it with the political. You know, this is a very important song for the Afghan people. This, she's talking about those who are in exile because of the Taliban, you know, they had to flee the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan. Right? So she takes about anyone who's separated from the source, but then she does also something else. She critiques those so-called guardians of Islam, the mullahs, who, of course, have their, no their idea of what is knowledge about God is based through law. And she's saying, you cannot know, know God through this law, and you can only know God through this love and this music and the way I communicate through poetry is a very powerful way in which I pray to God. Prayer doesn't need to take place in a mosque. It can take place everywhere because everywhere you can remember God. And that line of hers actually, uh, this idea of course, ignorance causing great misery. We, we know about that, how people assert their authority. But that line of hers, also reminds me of a very famous verse by a Persian poet, Saadi, who said, uh, talking about this notion that you can see the face of God everywhere, he said, every leaf of every tree becomes a scripture when the soul has learned to read. So with that, I will stop. Thank you.